great to be here with you. As you've already heard, I am Julie James. I host Broadway Names with Julie James, no relation, and um, on Sirius XM radio featuring show tunes and celebrity and news and all those great things about Broadway coast to coast 24-7. I'm delighted to be taking the next hour or maybe two, if George speaks in his signature slow rate, um, to introduce you to a piece of theater that I've been obsessed with since its world premiere at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego, a show whose imminent Broadway arrival I've been anticipating since I first heard the music. And we're going to hear a full five songs showcased here today with very special guests, including the world premiere of one of uh, the new numbers from the show. Allegiance is a new American musical based on true events, which means, of course, that I can't go any further without introducing our guest of honor. He's a sci-fi icon, a tireless advocate for human rights and the star of Allegiance. <laughs> A man who really needs no introduction because you're already friends with him on Facebook. That's right, here he is, the one and only George Takei. <laughs> welcome, welcome, George. Thank you very much. <sighs> this is gonna be great. So let's dive right in. One thing that people may not know about Allegiance is that it's inspired by your very childhood and your years while imprisoned during the Japanese-American internment and that you yourself were an internee. Yes, that is correct. It's unbelievable. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, um, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, as you know, in. Uh, on December 7th, 1941. And that plunged the whole world into another world war. For Japanese Americans, American citizens of Japanese ancestry, it was a catastrophic uh, experience because overnight, we were looked at with suspicion and fear and outright hatred simply because we happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. And the hysteria grew and grew until on February 19th, 1942, the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, ordered all Japanese Americans on the West Coast, approximately 120,000 of us, to be summarily rounded up with no charges, with no trial, with no due process, the central uh, pillar of our justice system, and ordered them to be incarcerated in 10 barbed wire prison camps in some of the most god-awful places in this country, the blistering hot desert of Arizona, the sultry swamps of Arkansas, southeastern Arkansas, the cold windswept high plains of Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, and two of the most desolate places in California. On April 20th, I celebrated my fifth birthday. And my parents tell me that they gave me a birthday party, but I don't remember that. Because a few weeks after that, my parents got me, my brother a year younger, and my baby sister, not uh, yet a year old. They got us up very early and they hurriedly dressed us. And my brother and I were in the living room looking out the front window, and we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway. They carried rifles with bayonets shining on top of them. They stomped up the front porch and banged on the front door. My father answered it, and literally at gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home. My father gave my brother and me little pieces of luggage to carry, and we went out on the driveway and waited for our mother to come out. She took some time, and when she finally emerged, she had our baby sister in one arm and a huge duffel bag in the other, 
and tears were streaming down both her cheeks. I may have been five years old, but I will never forget that terrifying morning. We were taken from our home on a truck where there were other Japanese American families uh, gathered to uh, Santa Anita Racetrack, a nearby racetrack, and driven to the uh, stable area where we were unloaded. And we were herded over to the uh, stable area. And we were told by the soldiers that this one horse stall would be where we would stay temporarily while the camps are being built. All five of us, three children and, and our parents, moved from a two-bedroom home on Garnet Street in Los Angeles to this smelly horse stall. For my parents, it was a degrading, humiliating, painful experience. But for five-year-old me, I thought it was kind of fun that we get to sleep with a horsey sleep. If you breathe deeply, you can smell them. So we were there for a few months. And then the, uh, the uh, construction of the uh, camps was completed. And we were put on trains with armed soldiers at both ends of each car, as if we were criminals. And we're, we were transported two thirds of the way across the country to the swamps of southeastern Arkansas. I still remember the barbed wire fences that uh, confined me, the tall sentry towers with the machine guns pointed at us. I remember the searchlight that followed me when I made the night runs to the latrine. But young children are amazingly adaptable. What would be grotesquely abnormal in normal times became nor my normality behind those barbed wire fences. It became normal for me to line up three times a day to eat lousy food in a noisy mess hall. It became routine for me to go to a mass shower with my father. And it became normal for me to go to school in a black tar paper barrack and begin the school day with a pledge of allegiance to the flag. I could see the barbed wire fence in the sentry tower right outside my schoolhouse window as I recited the words, with liberty and justice for all. Incredible. It's such an incredible thing that you're going to be telling this true life story, a mostly unknown story of America, and events that you lived through, but that you're going to be reenacting these events on a Broadway stage. What does that mean to you? It's a very meaningful experience for me, very exciting for me. But it is profoundly me meaningful to Japanese American families mm -hmm. and to the Japanese American community. And like um, all musicals, there is the story of forbidden love. <laughs> and it's an epic story of the World War II battles. We tell the story of the heroic, most decorated military unit in the entire Second World War, which happened to be made up of all Japanese Americans, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. And, but most of all, it's a story of two people, a brother. I play Sammy, and Sammy's sister, uh, played by uh, Leia Salonga. And it's their story, their adventures. It's a story that you've never heard, but a family that you will never forget. Mm, beautiful, beautifully said. So, um, you know, words are, are powerful, and we have um, a lot of great plays on Broadway. Why did you think that a musical would be the best way to tell the story of, of allegiance and your, your history? Words have the power of reaching the, the brain, set us thinking. Music reaches the heart, 
our feelings. And when you combine the two together in a musical, it becomes a singular force. It is a beautiful story that we tell. And uh, that story is still too little known in this country. And so I've spent most of my adult life talking about it to universities, uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, governmental agencies, and to corporate groups. Mm -hmm. And we've developed a musical about it. And this is what's so uh, exciting to me. And I consider this musical my legacy project. And uh, my husband, Brad, shares with me this passion to get our legacy project on Broadway. Oh, that's so sweet. Is Brad here? Hi, Brad, <laughs> everybody. Brad Jacquet. It's so great to see you here and, and to, you know, the fact that, that he's by your side through th and believing in you 100% and, and helping shepherd this is, is fantastic. It's so great to see you, Brad. Um, so now in the, in the show Allegiance, you play not one but two characters, right? That's correct. Uh, in the um, San Diego production at the Old Globe, I had the pleasure of uh, sharing the role of Sam Kimura with a very talented young man, Telly Leong. I love Telly. Oh yeah, he's a fantastic <laughs> performer. And uh, Telly plays Sam as a young man uh, during the period of the internment. And I play Sam in the present, many years later. <laughs> <laughs> but I also play Sam's grandfather, an immigrant uh, man who uh, came to this country uh, with hope and ambition. And uh, he's something of a rascal. <laughs> and I'm Type all right casting? with that. <laughs> <laughs> Typecasting, I hear. Um, Telly is, of course, a veteran of the Broadway <laughs> stage. Uh, you might have seen him in Wicked or Rent or Godspell. Um, many fans will recognize him from Glee. And um, unfortunately, Telly, like some of our other original cast members, was not able to be here today. But we are lucky enough to have some behind the scenes footage of Telly recording an upcoming single from the score of Allegiance, and it's called What Makes a Man? father has wishes, a son should help bring them alive. But here in this wasteland, it's hard enough just to survive. He'll never understand me, I'll never make the way. If I let him command me, I'll spend my life in this bed I've made. I should be out there, far past the fences and wire. But I look like the enemy, so there's no way to climb any higher. I'll fight my battles here first, making a difference or two. But let me make one thing clear first, I will do more than make do. What makes a man? Is it where he's from, or the color of his skin? What makes a man? Is it what he owns, or the places where he's been? What makes a man? Is what he makes of himself while he's giving it all he can. That's what makes a man. The things that I failed at, I never wanted for me, but I hear my calling. I would die for the right to live free. Our people will need support now. We're out on our own, make or break. It's no time to come up short now. There is so much now at stake. To them, I'm 
just a number on a beat up luggage tag. A nameless, faceless body in a crowd. When the world is upside down, find the upside, turn around. Chills everywhere. Oh my gosh. Oh, that was fantastic. Uh, Telly Leung in that video. Um, you know, uh, Allegiance isn't actually, though, the story of just one man. It's about a lot no, more. No, it isn't. It's about uh, our family and the community. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's uh, about America because it was our Constitution that was egregiously violated. But primarily, the story is about Sam Kimura and his sister, Kay Kimura. And that sister is played by the luminous Lea Salonga, a Tony Award winner for her starring role in Miss Saigon and the voice of uh, Jasmine in Aladdin mm -hmm. and uh, also the voice of Mulan in the Disney uh, animated film. And... Uh, she is spectacular. It's a story that uh, people have never heard, but it's a family you will not forget. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the other things I'm really struck by in the show is the strength and determination of the women in, in Allegiance. Um, one of the songs that comes to mind is um, it's called Stronger Than Before. And uh, it's a duet sung between the two main female characters. And like a lot of women during World War II, um, the characters have both been empowered by the fight for freedom and found strength in two surprising places, the support of an unexpected ally and also from within themselves. Here to sing the world premiere, this is really special, everybody, of Stronger Than Before are two Broadway treasures. We have Wicked's Lindsay Mendez and Godspell's Anna Marie Perez de Tagla singing a special pop arrangement by Lynn Schenkel. Welcome, ladies. I don't 
trust in others fast but at last i see you're a fighter just like me and though trouble makes its way into everything i do i'm grateful to have you to face what's still in the store and i'm stronger than before stronger than before with someone by my side to even out the score we came from different places but here we are as friends sisters with different faces My favorite Broadway voices. They are fantastic. And what? if you know the context of that song, it is so moving. Mm. It comes near the end. Yeah. And it is powerful. Yeah. Brings, brings back some memories of some Kristen and Adina for me. <laughs> um, so George, one of the main, <coughs> I guess, central pieces of the plot um, of Allegiance focuses on uh, the loyalty questionnaire. Can you tell us more about that? The loyalty questionnaire turned all 10 camps into turmoil. This was a year into imprisonment, and the government realized that there is a wartime manpower shortage, and here are all these young people that we labeled enemy non-aliens. Non-aliens. What does that mean? That's a citizen defined in the negative. They even took the word citizen away from us and put us in these prison camps. How do we tap them? Their solution was a outrageous solution, a loyalty questionnaire, which was a series of questions. But there were two key questions that everyone in the camp had to respond to. Everyone over 17 years of age, from 17 to 87, from uh, a man or woman, American born or an immigrant. Question, question 27, one of the two controversial questions, asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? This being asked of a 17-year-old young man or an 87-year-old immigrant lady. It was preposterous. Question 28 was one sentence, and it was a, a very insidious sentence with two opposite ideas. It asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? We're Americans. For the government to assume that we're born with a loyalty to the Emperor, that there's something genetic about a loyalty to the Emperor, was outrageous. Yeah. You can't forswear something that you don't have. So my father said, they took my business, they took our home, they took our freedom, 
The one thing I'm not going to give them is my dignity. I am not going to grovel before this government. He answered no. And for that, he was labeled disloyal. There was another group of young men who said, I will fight for my country because I'm an American. But I will fight as an American. If I can report to my hometown draft board with my family back home, I will fight for this country. But I will not go as an internee going from behind these barbed wire fences, leaving my family and loved ones behind. And for that courageous, principled stand, they were tried for draft evasion, found guilty, and thrown into federal penitentiaries. But there's another amazing group of people. These young men bit the bullet, and, and women too, they bit the bullet swallowed their pride, and answered both questions as the government wanted them to. And they went from behind these barbed wire fences, putting on the same uniform as that of the sentries that guarded over us, leaving their family and loved ones in imprisonment to fight for this country. And their story is an amazing story. They fought with incredible courage, and valor. They sustained the highest combat casualty rate of any unit of its comparable size. And they came back the single most decorated unit of the entire war. They were welcomed back to the United States on the White House lawn by President Truman, who said to them, you fought not only the enemy, but prejudice, and you won. That's incredible. You know, I think one of the things that really strikes me about this story, your story, is that throughout all of this, at the same time, you're keeping up some sense of normalcy. <laughs> it's just absolutely incredible. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's my parents, actually, yeah. and all the adults that did it. Yes, we tried to have normalcy while living in those black tar paper barracks. My mother scavenged around and got uh, the military to give her some scrap uh, military fabric. And she made uh, curtains <laughs> for our barrack windows so that we'd have some privacy. There were some who had green thumbs. And they took that barren landscape and turned it into bountiful, productive victory gardens, if you will. Hmm. And uh, there were others uh, who uh, were handy with crafts. and. They worked on crafts. My father loved baseball, and he was a member of uh, our block baseball team. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to sleep uh, at the end of the day. My mother put us to bed early because we were kids, uh, hearing the songs of the 1940s. Because the camp command, uh, occasionally, about every other month, allowed the young people to uh, have dances in the mess hall after dinner. They cleared the tables and the benches away and uh, played their dance songs, or they may have performed themselves. And I went to bed listening to the big band sound of Tommy Dorsey or the Andrews Sisters, the swing sound or the bebop sounds. And so that's one of the fond memories of my childhood in and in prison uh, prison camp yeah that's a, that's astounding um we're going to use some of that as inspiration for the next song that we're going to hear is kind of just such a dance dan sort of a dance tune mm -hmm. the song paradise i understand parodies both the injustice of the internment and the propaganda surrounding it but it's a toe tapping number um kind of the likes of which you can only see on Broadway. So here to perform Paradise from the cast of If Then is Mark De La Cruz. Welcome.
Desert swamp and dusty waste, they say location's key. Sure, you shiver in this icebox, but cheer up, the rent is free. And we all love to freeze in line for soggy bowls of rice. Just put up and shut up, cause you're in paradise. Is everybody happy? No. Tough. When it's pitch black dark at night, the army might assume that you're trying to escape. If you're running to the bathroom, let them aim their spotlights down, but smile real nice. Just put up and shut up, cause you're in paradise. Separate disloyals from the rest. All you have to do to pass is hold your nose and answer yes. A no no seals your fate, and you will pay a heavy price. They'll grab you and send you away from paradise. Saving grand in paradise. The snakes don't bother you if you feed them all the Right? Paradise. So the president gets reelected, right? Put up and shut up. Just 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 shut it up. You're in paradise. Take this paradise. Mark and the cast. Oh, I love that. That is so Broadway. Is that yeah. terrific? Love it. So, George, anyone who hears you speak or you know knows you from online, knows your body of work, knows that you always just shoot for the stars. You have so much optimism and faith in humankind. You've been a catalyst for social justice and innovation. I mean, you're unbelievable. You always ask us to be our highest selves and to better to better ourselves, even if it's grammar online. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> keep it coming. Keep it coming. I love the. <laughs> um, so I guess what I what I really want you to speak to is how is it possible that a man like you, who spent your childhood as a political prisoner, can have all of this? unending optimism and resounding faith in humankind? Well, I think I'm basically an optimistic guy. <laughs> uh, I had parents that were optimists. Uh, I think uh, it's optimism that gets things done. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do it. Mm -hmm. I can do a marathon, 26.2 miles. People say that's impossible. But you say to yourself, I will do it. Mm -hmm. And even when your muscles complain. You say, <laughs> muscle, you will do it. And you wind up doing it. And that attitude is um, in my grandfather character, Oji-san. Mm -hmm. He has a wonderful line that I love. He says, and he's an immigrant from Japan, you see, flower bloom where it is planted. Mm. <laughs> so even in those harsh circumstances, desolate uh, high plains or the swamps or the deserts, you try to be the best of yourself. Yeah, that's so inspiring. I think um, that determination is really at the heart of Allegiance and it's also at the heart of the next song that we're going to present. You probably will recognize our next guest from a little tiny show called American Idol. And uh, she is going to be singing higher. Here is the fantastic Melinda Doolittle.
once was a little girl playing on a swing set when her grandpa built by a sycamore tree near the rusty farmyard gate. And while her mama pinned the laundry, the little girl would cry out loud, push me higher, push me higher, push me, I can't wait. Her mama would push a couple times, but there was laundry still to do. So she learned to use her own strength, to pull her own weight, push on through to swing higher, higher than before, higher, but afraid to reach for something more, higher, higher towards the sky, until the day she bent to kiss her mama a last goodbye. There once was a little boy who rode that swing set. He had a licorice twist from the store in town and two knobby skinned up knees. And while his sister pinned the laundry, that little boy would cry out loud, push me higher, push me higher, push me pretty please. The girl would push a couple times, but there was laundry still to do. And she watched amazed as that little boy simply pulled its own way through to swing higher, higher than she dared, higher, how he swing so high and not be scared, higher, he could touch the sky, right then she knew that he would also one day tell her goodbye. That little boy, he seemed so sure Was it something never taught to her? How the years passed quickly by The girl's a woman still afraid to try Is it too late to start again? Get back that feeling I had then But now my life is upside down There's no more farm, there's no more town And no use asking why But I won't let it Another of our special guests here today. Sensational. And the song, In Context, you won't believe how moving it is. Wow, wow. So um, I know many of your fans are dying to know, George, including me. When is Allegiance coming to Broadway? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, well, as you know, there are many, many plays lined up waiting to get a vacancy, and every theater on Broadway is occupied. Spoken for, right, yes. right. Well, I'm a farmer's grandson. My grandfather was a farmer in uh, the Sacramento Delta. And um, when a farmer feels something in his bones, that's pretty reliable. And I feel in my bones that we will be on Broadway in 2015. All right. 2015. So those of you who have already bought your uh, uh, priority, uh, priority access pass or are on our email list or follow me on Facebook, gamang. <laughs> That's so, the, so, a word you know now. Yes. Gamang. Yes, you've introduced and it to us. We will be on Broadway very soon. Excellent. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, 
I'm going to go back to Gaman in a, in a moment, but also I know that you actually have a very special surprise in store for everybody today. Oh, yes. We've made uh, the Allegiance mini album completely free to download on Google Play. Woo! You can get it all free. It features six songs for, from uh, Allegiance. And uh, we, this is our way of saying thank you to you for the support you've uh, given us on our trek to Broadway. <laughs> trek. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's fantastic. I love all of the cool ideas that you guys have come up with, like the priority access and all that. It's just fantastic. So going back to Gaman, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, since you've you've introduced me to that word, and uh, so, but for anybody who's watching or, or here in our audience that doesn't know, can you tell us exactly what that means? Yes. Gamma means to endure with dignity, to overcome what whatever... Uh, challenges you, 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 you're facing by confidence and fortitude. And it's a word that, you know, I heard from my mother often in camp. I remember uh, particularly when we were lined up for the, at the latrine, and um, there I was, you know, wiggling and, and doing a jig to, uh, <laughs> to try to contain myself. And my mother would say, Come on, George, <laughs> come on. And I gritted my teeth. And I'm proud to tell you, I always made it to the latrine with <laughs> dignity. <laughs> but it's that word gamang that made it possible for us to make it through that, uh, that uh, period of, uh, uh, th that horrible period yeah. behind those barbed wire fences. Gamang. Yeah. It's what kept made it kept it possible for us to love each other and to love this country that we were born in. Yeah. The story of perseverance is perfect. It's a Gaman is a wonderful note for us to end our little special showcase here today. So here to perform Gaman from the score of Allegiance is a spectacular group of Broadway performers. Come on, welcome them to the stage.
So uh, this is really exciting. We're going to actually spend a couple of minutes doing a Q&A, and I want to invite anyone who has a question. Uh, we're going to be inviting the creative team of Allegiance to join us on stage with George. And if you have a question, we have microphones on the right and left side of the house. And so we would just ask you to step right up if you have a question. And then we also have uh, uh, George's legion of internet fans, I know, are <laughs> have been furiously submitting their questions as well. So we're going to try to take some of those. So um, let me just have a quick intro from our creative team so you know who you are being joined by here today. It's great to see you guys. What a great I'm presentation. Um, I'm Lorenzo Fione, and I'm the co-book writer and producer of The Legion. Um, I'm Jay Quo. I'm the composer and lyricist of the show. I'm Mark Isito. I'm the co-book writer. I'm Lynn Shankle. I'm the music supervisor, arranger, orchestrator. Stafford Arima, the director. Gosh, what a great, great showcase today that you gave us. This is a, a, a brief taste of allegiance. It's just fantastic. We just won't wonderful. disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would love to dig right in. Do we have anyone that has a question? I think you do. Uh, I, I see someone here in the audience. I was just curious, uh, when are tickets going on sale? Um, <laughs> Ooh, I'll take that we one. like that one. <laughs> Um, so, like George said, um, we've been waiting for a theater, and we hope something will happen for us very, very soon. But we did come up, and George, George talked about it, we did come up with an interesting idea for getting people who were interested in the show and were following its development and were eager to, uh, to buy tickets um, to go online even today and buy what we call the priority access pass for $5. You actually get to be first in line to buy tickets to the Broadway show before the tickets go on sale to the general public, which is an interesting way to sort of make sure that you have your uh, pick uh, to whatever performance you want. You know, before any anybody else gets access to the tickets, you get your uh, your ability to to buy a ticket. And if you then come to the show, you also get a free download of the um, the full cast album, not the mini album. So it's definitely a a great value, and it's a great way for us to know that there's a real audience out there waiting for the show to happen. And I might add. For those of you who have friends and relatives out of town who are going to be co uh, coming to New York to see Allegiance, it is particularly a good idea to get a priority access pass because you're not going to be here for a length of, uh, you know, a long time. It's a limited period of time. And so you can have your dibs on a pair of tickets before they go on sale to the public and be assured that those few days that you, they're going to be in town, they have a pair of tickets to see the greatest show they're going to see on Broadway, <laughs> Allegiance. I love this guy. <laughs> well said. Do we have any other? I'm a television actor. I'm used yeah. to doing commercials. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your question. Hi there. I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, I love to ask uh, Broadway performers when they come a bit about their experience putting their own personality into the show and ad-libbing, but I think it's a great opportunity. We have some of the behind-the-scenes group here that makes it happen, so I'd love to hear from your perspective. Um, ad-libbing, adapting the show after it's written, is that something you encourage, you have a part in? Is that solely up to the actors? I'd love to hear your, your take on that. Well, I think that uh, once uh, a show has been written and we have a, a group of authors who have uh, created dialogue and lyrics and specific uh, um, words to say, the, the, the hope is that the actor will remain uh, kind of on book, meaning will say the words that have been written uh, as is. I think that the, uh, the element of something feeling spontaneous on stage, which is why a lot of uh, audience members enjoy the live theater performances because it does feel alive and and uh, and spontaneous. That comes from an actor's uh, bringing to the material uh, a kind of reality of that moment. If a performer perhaps kind of zones into a um, just kind of like doing it by route, then the performance might feel stale. But you know, 99% of performers when they're in a show stay kind of alive with the material, but 
still have the kind of context of this is the, the words that I have to say, this is the blocking that I have to do, because in, in theater, you know, lights are created, uh, spotlights are created, there are, are specific areas of the stage that need, the actor needs to go to. So if the actor had decided one day, oh, I just want to walk around the stage and, <laughs> and, and not follow what was uh, given, then he or she might be out of the light uh, and all of that kind of stuff. So I think, in essence, spontaneity and, 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 and an honest performance will come from an aliveness, uh, but still within the context of the material. The performers make it their own. I think that's what a p audience senses when it feels spontaneous. You watch Melinda Doolittle today, and that's the first time I've heard her sing that song. And you know, hearing it in context of the show, it feels like it's one thing and it's part of this story that we've already been telling you. But what it pointed out to me was just how universal that story is. How it felt like it was Melinda Doolittle's story. I'm thinking about, you know, oh, I didn't know she had you know, a swing when she was a kid, Melinda Doolittle, you know, and we wrote it, you know. But it felt, it, it, they make it so their own, it, you feel as if it's them speaking to you. And with you know, Melinda, I'd follow her anywhere, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Great answers, everybody. Um, we have some questions. Uh, we have a question here in the audience. We also have some from online. So if you guys can refresh my screen, I think we have, uh, have some questions that are coming in from our online fan base. But uh, what's your question here in the audience today? Hi. Uh, this is for George. I was curious how much you had to do with the writing versus just providing the story. Like, did you provide dialogue? Uh, no. Uh, we have some gifted uh, writers here. I, um, it actually began in the Broadway theater. Um, Brad and I went to see, um, well, uh, actually began in, uh, in off-Broadway theater, um, Forbidden Broadway. And uh, there were two guys sit seated in front of us. They happened to be Lorenzo and Jay, who I didn't know from Adam. But they recognized my voice, and they turned around. That's and that's totally <laughs> recognizable voice. <laughs> chatted a little bit. I guess I have a recognizable vo uh, voice. <laughs> and we saw that they were theater lovers. And uh, that evening, uh, Brad and I went back to our apartment saying, yeah, um, it's wonderful to have chatted with those guys. The next night, we went to see uh, um, In the Heights, um, the, the Puerto Rican family in, uh, in the Washington Heights. and. Um, we walked into the theater, and there were those two same guys. <laughs> they thought, seated in the they thought the, that we were stalking them. <laughs> <laughs> and our seats were in the same row. And so we did think you're stalking us. At some point uh, during Act One, there's a song called Inu Inutil, which means useless, and it's about In a father. Inutil. Inutil. Right? Your <laughs> Spanish pronunciation is terrible. <laughs> And uh, I, I looked over and I saw uh, George crying during that song. And so during the intermission, I asked him what had moved him so much um, during that song. And he started telling me about how the, the notion of uselessness re really resonated with him because his father felt so useless um, trying to protect and preserve their family while they were in the internment camps of Arkansas. And every hair on my body stood on end because I was hearing for the first time this story and realizing this is a terrific story. And I just turned to Lorenzo and I said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And, and, and we said. It's like a quintessential American epic. You know, <laughs> this, the type of struggle that these people had to endure for a country that many had come and sought after um, you know, as a promised land uh, was just something that we thought was a, was a story that would resonate with audiences right. and everywhere. And so just a few weeks later, we, we had sent uh, a, um, um, a, or a, a, a sort of a review of it. Or, um, Jay works fast. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, a few and, weeks uh, later, a I got a song <laughs> right. on my computer, and I listened to it, wow. and I was bawling at my computer again. <laughs> and so I invited them to come to the uh, Japanese American National Museum, which we founded in Los Angeles. It's an affiliate of the Smithsonian, and introduced them to the uh, details of the uh, internment experience. Mm. So fascinating. Uh, on top of that, though, I'd like to add that th the story, of course, is inspired by George's true story, and the creation of the characters were really inspired by him as well. When I came onto the project, George was playing Sam, but which is a very serious part, and there's a, a chance for him to play some high drama, but there wasn't any plans, place for him to play comedy. 
And I said, we have this now, this sci-fi legend has now become an internet comedy legend. And I said, you got to give this guy something to do. Uh, so we invented the role of Oji-san for him to be able to have that other side. And it really speaks to what inspired me most about the story is the absolute the the intrepid quality that the Japanese American people had, the, and the, the way they kept their sense of humor, and the way in which they blossomed where they were planted, they they grew so much uh, uh, in their gardens that they actually had a surplus that they supplied the War Department in a place that nobody ever w thought anything would grow. They bloomed where they were planted. It's a daily inspiration to us. I mean, I, I'll tell you truly, you have to own gaman. If the subway goes away and you're like, oh, I have a terrible life, you're like, no yeah, one's I'm putting me in a camp. Gam on, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly said. We have a great question from the G Dog in Fremont. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love that screen name. Uh, having seen the show in San Diego, um, I'm curious what changes are being made for the eventual Broadway version. Good question. A lot. <laughs> Do you want to speak to that, or are we? I, I, I think it's it has become more refined. It, it, the the show has runs the the gamut in terms of its bandwidth of its you know it'd be so easy for this to be considered a tragedy but at the same time it's the triumph of the human spirit so finding that full range and the balance between those things where we can take the audience to despair and then uplift them has been uh, I think we've, a real we've, focus. We've uh, worked on a lot of new music, and um, Lynn, it's a real pleasure to work with Lynn, uh, arranging some some of the new songs and and working that up together. Especially for this presentation, it was yes. This what we did. Um, what the two ladies sang today, um, stronger than before, we, it was an arrangement that that I made specifically for for this event. Like it, it's a lot poppier than it is in uh, than it is in the show itself, and that's we just kind of wanted to show. You know, a different side of things, and along what Jay was saying, just to, to really show that these themes really are universal, that it's not just um, a show about Asians for Asians, that, that these themes are universal. I mean, I can relate to all of the songs that, that you know that, that we've that we've sung today, um, but we have a lot of exciting new material. Um, been working on a new opening number, the number that you heard today, and um, and a couple more. And I'm so excited to, you to know, get back I, to work. I just want to add one thing, which is even San Diego came, you know, sort of midway through a development process that had taken years, and um, you know the process has continued. But one thing that we've always um, sort of we've been pleasantly surprised at the fact that um, no matter how much the show had changed, no matter how many new scenes, no matter how many new numbers, no matter how, how many songs we would cut, and there are more songs cut than there are in the show, uh, <laughs> um, and then put back, it always felt like the same show. It always felt like the story we were telling and the journey we were bringing the audience with us on was the same one. And that sort of reinforced in us the idea that we were making progress towards the right goal. Yeah, really good. How are we doing on time? Do we have time for another question from the online fans? One more. All right, one more. Um, this is a good one from JNN. 38364 up in Ontario. Uncle George, <laughs> which I love that she calls you that. Uh, you have been through so much in your life. Was it difficult to play a role in the production without getting overly emotional? Or was the show and sharing this story more therapeutic? Well, she's my niece calling in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the Wait, you said I was your niece. <laughs> I have a lot of nieces, believe me. And nephews. <laughs> Blonde-haired ones, red-haired ones, freckle-faced nieces. <laughs> uh, this play is so specific and, as was said, so universal. The characters are so rich and so human. And to be one of them in this story, uh, it tears me apart, and I am reliving that, and yes, it's a catharsis. I have a final scene there as Sam. That is uh, an opportunity for me to feel everything that I've felt as an adult and let it hang out. It's a wonderful, wonderful 
personal as well as professional experience. Oh, and I love that you said it was your legacy, and that just is so, so touching. And we cannot wait to get more news for Allegiance to come to Broadway in your words, 2015. Let's let's put the good let's put the good juju out there, everybody. Um, I want to remind everyone that on your way out today, there is an Allegiance CD for you to pick up. And of course, uh, as George told everybody that's watching online, it's available for free today on Google Play. So don't miss your chance to get that f uh, that great six songs for free, especially Gaman, as we as we've all said, we all need we all need some Gaman. And I. I really want to thank um, our incredible performers and special guests who were here joining us today and our creative team. You did such a fantastic job. Uh, of course, the one and only George Takei. Thank you all for being here. I'm Julie James. Thank you so much. <laughs>